What's up winners? I feel like I needed to make this video since we are in the middle of a recession, rising interest rates, and huge companies that are laying off its employees. Whether you currently have collections or have accounts that may go into collections, this will be the most important video that you watch. The thing is, is that most people have no idea on how to respond to collections, what rights they have, and even know how to tangle with those pesky debt collectors. Today, we're gonna to be diving headfirst into the world of collections and when you should and should not pay them. Now, before you start raising eyebrows, let me clarify. There are plenty of cases where you should not pay collections, but there are also times where it could be a smart move and it could actually boost your credit score or get lending. You know that having bad credit can wreak havoc on your financial dreams. Dreaming of a new house, a shiny car, or even getting a decent car insurance rate your credit score can make or break those dreams. And let me tell you, having a collections account or charge off on your credit report packs a serious punch. We're talking about a drop of anywhere between 30 to a few hundred points. So first off, let me go over some terminology. There's usually some confusion between debt, charge offs, and collections. The first is debt. I'm pretty sure you know what this is, but for those who don't, debt is when you owe someone money or need to pay back a certain amount of money that you borrowed. But when you borrow money, you would also have to pay extra money called interest, which makes borrowing money more expensive. Now, if you don't pay back what you owe, this is where problems happen. So this brings me to the next term, which is charge off. A charge off is an accounting term used by lenders to indicate that they have given up on collecting the debt from you. This typically happens when you have not made payments for a certain period of time, usually six months or more. When a debt is charged off, a lender writes it off as a loss on their financial statements and may sell the debt to a collections agency. Now this brings us to our last term, which is a collections. A collection occurs when a debt is sold or assigned to a third party debt collector, who would then attempts to collect the debt from you. The debt collector may collect you via phone, mail, or email to try to negotiate a payment plan or settlement. If you don't respond or make payments, the debt collector may take legal action against you, such as filing a lawsuit. So let me give you a real example to bring this full circle. Let's just say that Peter has a $5,000 balance on one of his credit cards. This is called debt. He is keeping up with his payments, but he faced some financial hardships and got laid off. Even though he had an emergency fund, paying a credit card was the last of his worries. He ends up not paying his credit card for a few months until the bank finally charges off his account. Once this happens, the bank decides to sell the debt to a collections company for $100. Now the debt collector owns and controls this debt. They can now continue to attempt to collect or seek legal action. Now this brings me on to our next point, what debt collectors can and cannot do. If you had ever spoken to a debt collector, you know how stressful it can be. All of the information provided here is from the Federal Trade Commission, so all of this information is legit. Also remember that laws and regulations do change all the time, so this info should not be looked at as legal advice. So let's go over what debt collectors can do. They can contact you via phone, mail, or email to collect a debt, ask you to pay what you owe or set up a payment plan, provide information about the debt, such as the amounts owed and the creditor, contact your spouse or attorney if you have given them permission to do so, and report your debt to the credit bureaus. On the flip side, this is what they cannot do. They cannot harass, threaten, or intimidate you, use obscene or profound language, call you before 8 a.m. or after 9 p.m., contact you at work if you have not asked them to do so, lie or misrepresent themselves, such as claiming to be a government agency, add unauthorized fees or charges to the debt, and threaten you to take legal action unless they actually attend to do so. So most of this is self-explanatory, but I wanna dive a little bit deeper in some of them. Let's talk about debt collectors contacting you at work. There are only specific reasons on why they can't do so. This includes verifying your employment, get your location information to garnish your wages, but this is only after if they sue you and there is a judgment against you, find out whether or not you have medical insurance if the debt was a medical debt, or agree that the debt collector can't contact your employer. Now, normally debt collectors would have to contact your employer via letter first if they did not receive a response within a time frame, this is when they call. So these will be the only reasons on when a debt collector can contact your workplace. It is not meant for them to chase you for the debt while you are working. So if they got all the necessary information from your employer, but they are trying to chase you for the debt at your workplace, this is where they are actually breaking the law and you can actually file a complaint or even sue them. I have seen this happen so many times and most people and employers don't really know how to handle debt collectors, so they would just allow this to happen. It's unfortunate that most people are not aware what they can and cannot do. Now, let's talk about how collections affect your credit. When you owe money and it goes to collections, it can stay on your credit report for up to seven years from the date that you first missed the payment and did not make it current. 
This means that negative information can affect your credit score and the ability to borrow more money. However, after seven years, the information should be automatically removed from your credit report. If it is not, then it is a good time to dispute with the credit bureaus. I do have a simple dispute letter down in the description if you want to download it. It does not matter if the debt is transferred to another creditor. The original delinquency date remains the same for both the original account and the collection agency account. Also, collections account can bounce around to different agencies, and this should not change the original delinquency date either. Now, let's talk about how long debt collectors can actually collect the debt. The amount of time that a collection agency can collect a debt varies depending on the state, and there's no set time frame at a national level. This is called the Statutes of Limitations, and it is governed by the Federal Debt Collection Practices Act and state laws. In most states, it is four years, but in some states like Illinois, it can be as high as 10 years. However, the length of time that account remains active on your credit report is determined by the Fair Credit Reporting Act. In the case of collections, it is seven years. In some states, the statutes of limitations for collecting debt may be longer than the time it can remain on your credit report. Therefore, a creditor may still try to collect the debt even though after it has been removed from your credit report. Now, let's talk about legal action for a second. Debt collectors can definitely seek out legal action when a debt is still within the statutes of limitations. If they have to, they can serve you a summons which can force you to pay the debts or even have your wage garnished. Meaning that there is an amount from your pay that will be deducted automatically until the settlement amount is paid off. This can go on for years, even if it's no longer on your credit report. So for instance, if you live in California, once your account becomes delinquent, debt collectors have four years where they can actually seek out legal action. Once the four years is up, this debt is now considered time barred. All this means is that a debt collector can no longer sue you to collect. So this is actually against the law for debt collectors to threaten to sue you or attempt to sue you when the debt is outside the statutes of limitations. I will go over this a little bit later in the video in the case that you do get a summons and what steps to take, so stay tuned for that. So it would be best to Google statutes of limitations for debt in your specific state since I can't cover all 50 in this video. Now let's talk about your options when it comes to collections. The first one is to pay nothing. Funny enough, this is what plenty of people actually do. If you do nothing, it will just stay on your credit report until it falls off after seven years. But depending on when the first occurred, there is a time period when a collection agency can attempt to sue or collect this debt. If you were to go this route, it would probably be best to wait after the statutes of limitations in your specific state. The second option is to pay off the debt. Now, I would only recommend this specific step when you definitely need to or when it benefits your credit. So if you do decide to pay off your collections account, it would be best to negotiate as low as possible from the original amounts owed. Typically 15 to 25% is a good start, but anything under 50% is still a good deal. I would also recommend trying to pay it off in full if possible, because this is how you will get most collection agencies to agree to remove it off of your credit report. So on that note, you would want to make sure that the debt actually gets removed from your credit report, since this is where you would see the most benefit on your credit score. Now, if you were just to pay it off, this would just get labeled as a paid collection on your credit report. This can help your credit score depending on the type of credit score that the lender is looking at. Typically with newer credit scoring models like 509 and up, paid collections have less of an effect on your credit score. Another reason to pay off your collections account is when you need to get any sort of lending such as a mortgage. A lot of lenders like to see a low debt to income ratio, so having any amount of debt would affect this number. Now let's dive into how to handle debt collectors when they contact you, especially when they call you on the phone. You might be tempted to ignore calls from unknown numbers, but what if you decide to pick up the phone? There's a widespread myth that if debt collectors call and you state your name, it confirms that the debt is yours. That is simply not true. Just because a debt collector has your name and phone number doesn't mean that they have the right person. Your contact information is public record and there could be hundreds of others with the same name as you. So if you receive a call from an unknown number, be cautious. Don't provide any personal information. It's common sense, but sometimes people get caught up when a caller sounds professional and end up revealing too much. If a suspected caller is a debt collector, take control of the conversation. Verify who's calling by asking for their first and last name and the name of their agency. Beyond that, keep communication to a minimum. Remember that most calls from debt collection agencies are recorded and you don't want to accidentally say something that could be used against you for later. At this point, request that they send you a letter in the mail about the alleged debt. If they ask for your address, don't provide it. Instead, tell them to send all the information to the address that they have on file. That way, you're not giving away any additional details. Once you receive the letter in the mail, it is time to take the next steps and dispute the debt. So with the letter in hand, you need to inspect this 
thoroughly. You need to make sure that your personal identification is correct, the dates, who was the original creditor, and provide you with all the necessary information that shows you that the debt is yours. So typically when you receive this letter, there should be something in the letter as well, which is in the fine print or somewhere between all the gibberish that if you believe this debt is not yours, you have the right to dispute it within 30 days. This is where a lot of people run into trouble. If you do nothing within 30 days, you're basically admitting guilt. Well, of course, there is a possibility that you never received this letter, but if they send it by certified mail and you sign for this letter, then they know for sure that you received it. So if there's anything that may be questionable, it is your right to challenge this debt. Now let me move on to something about the time frame of when debt collections can even be collected. First things first, when you receive a letter from the debt collector, check the dates to ensure that it is within the statutes of limitations. As mentioned before, the statutes of limitations is a period of which legal action can be taken to collect a debt. Each state will have its own rules, so you will need to do a quick Google search to find out the specifics in your location. For example, in California, a written contract, like a loan, can only be collected within four years of last report. This does not mean that the debt disappears from your credit report though, it would just stick around for seven years from the time it was first delinquent. Imagine that you defaulted on a loan in May of 2018. Fast forward to April 2023 and it's been almost five years, which means that the debt is outside the statutes of limitations for California. Many people pay off old debts without realizing that they're no longer legally obligated to do so. Any money a collection agency gets from you at this point is just a bonus for them. If your debt is outside the statutes of limitations, consider sending a cease and desist letter to the collections agency. Once they receive that, they should stop contacting you unless they plan to sue you in civil court. However, they can't summon you to court if the debt is past the statutes of limitations. So in the description, there will be a free template that will help you draft a cease and desist letter. First, let's dive into credit pair. You can tackle this yourself or hire a company to do it for you. Doing it yourself is entirely possible, but it requires persistence and attention to detail. When you receive a letter in the mail about your debt, it is crucial to act within 30 days. Otherwise, the debt collectors have identified you and you're essentially admitting guilt. If the letter asks you to pay a specific amount but doesn't provide enough information, don't pay. You need to verify whether the agency is authorized to collect the debt and if they are legitimate because there are plenty of scammers out there. Your first step after receiving the letter is to send a debt collection verification letter. You can find a set of most commonly used credit repair letters down in the description or you can just create your own. In the letter, the debt collection agency must verify the amount of the alleged debt, provide the original creditor's full name and mailing address, for instance, Chase Bank, and provide that they have verified your responsibility for the debt. They must also provide documentation showing that they are a legitimate business licensed to collect debts in your state. Under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, the agency has 30 days to respond. If they don't, then they can't pursue this debt. Then send a letter by certified mail with a receipt as this will be your key to getting the collections account off of your credit report. So once you receive the receipt and there is no response within 45 days, typically due to mailing times, report the inaccurate information to the credit bureaus. Make sure that you have all the copies of all the communications and send the information all to the credit bureaus and this will almost guarantee that the account will be removed. If the debt collection agency can't verify the information, then the credit bureau is reporting inaccuracies. Under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, anything unverifiable or inaccurate must be removed. So after sending a debt verification letter to the debt collection agency, the whole process should take anywhere between 60 to 90 days to remove the account from your credit report. If you want the exact steps that I take to remove collections, I do have a full course on the subject linked down in the description. Now, if you don't have the time to do any of this stuff, you can always hire a credit repair agency. Before you ask, I no longer accept clients for credit repair. Unfortunately, I just don't have the bandwidth to do it anymore. I get that credit repair agencies do get a bad rep because you don't know which companies are sketchy or which ones are legit. I would highly recommend finding a company that gives you a money back guarantee within 90 days just to make sure that they are actually doing the work. And if you don't see any progress by then, then you have the right to get a refund and cancel. Now let's move on to another situation. Let's just say that the debt is yours and you have gone through all the necessary steps of bearing finding that the debt is yours and confirm that it is yours. Your next best bet is to try to settle the debt. The first thing that you must think about is the reason on why you want to settle the debt. Determine what you want to achieve in a negotiation, such as minimizing the payment or removing negative items from your credit report. There are two ways that you can go about this. Either do it yourself or hire a debt settlement company. Let's go over doing it yourself first. So first, you would then want to contact the collection agency and negotiate a settlement. You should always get the settlement offered in writing. Never blindly take their word, 
This is all about keeping a paper trail. When you are in a negotiation process, most agencies will say that they report it as a paid collections item, but do not accept that. It is the same as paying the original amount and it will stay on your credit. The goal here is to actually remove the delinquency. It is best to get the agreement in writing that the agency will remove it completely from your report. Now, with that being said, it's becoming more and more commonplace for collection companies to remove a collections accounts once paid, but it's always your best bet to get a paper trail. When it comes to payment, you'd want to send a physical check rather than pay online. Let me explain why. With a check, you can add additional information. So on the memo line, this is where you would write your collections account number and the words, paid in full. The reason being is that if the collection agency accepts it, it means that they are agreeing to those terms. Now, if you're the type of person who does not like to talk to anybody through the phone, you can always give them a code offer by doing this suggestion. You would also write them a check and also write in the memo the settlement offer without ever negotiating or talking to them over the phone. So for example, if you owe $5,000 and you send them a check for $1,000 and in the memo line, you would just write the account number and paid in full. So if the collection agency cashes it, this means that they accepted your offer. So whatever route that you take, just make sure that you snap photos of the check prior to sending it out. You would also need to send this letter by certified mail since this will give you proof that they received the check. As I said many times before in this video, it is all about collecting a paper trail. Now, if you cannot pay up the collections account in full, then it is best to try to work out a payment plan that is short in length rather than something that could take years to pay off. The reason being is that the debt collection clock starts once the last payment is made, not the original date of the debt. So to clarify, this only pertains to the statutes of limitations, meaning when a collection agency has time to chase you for this debt and the period of time of when you can actually get sued. Now, the statutes of limitations last is depending on what kind of debt it is and the laws in your state. Also, under the laws of some states, if you make a payment or even acknowledge in writing that you owe the debt, the clock resets and a new statutes of limitation period begins. So that's why it's best to see what are the laws in your specific state to make sure that this is not applied to you. So let's go over the second way of settling your debt, which is hiring a debt settlement company. I am partnered with a company called AAA Debt Solutions, so you can find their contact information down in the description if you guys are interested in having someone else settle the debt for you. Now with debt settlement companies, they will negotiate on your behalf and set up a payment plan if needed. You should never have to pay a debt settlement company upfront for any work that they do. The only time that you would get paid is when you agree to the terms with the original creditor and you start making payments. So how debt settlement companies make money is by charging a fee based on a percentage of the total amount of debt that they successfully negotiated and settled for you. For example, if a company negotiates a $10,000 debt down to $5,000 and their fee is 25% of the settled amount, then you would have to pay a fee of $1,250. It is normally best to seek out debt settlement when you have an active ongoing debt or even if the debt is charged off. So this does not necessarily mean that you would only have to use them for collection accounts. You can actually use them for any time that you have debt. So for instance, let's just say that you owe a lot of credit card debt and your monthly minimum payments for all those credit cards is $3,000. They can help you negotiate the debt where your monthly payment will be only $1,100 a month and the total amount of debt that you would have to pay will be much less. So if you don't have the time or know-how to negotiate debt, you can always reach out to my partners at AAA Debt Solutions, link down in the description. So far, we went over disputing and settling link collections, and the third option when handling collections is to do nothing. You can wait until the negative account falls off your credit report, and then you will be in a clear which is seven years. Most states only allow debt collectors to seek out legal action within the first four years, but some can be much longer. If you decide to do nothing and the collection account is still within the statutes of limitations, this is where you can get a summons and a judgment can be placed on you. When a collection is still within the statutes of limitations, this is when you can get served. Depending on the debt and if they win, they can actually garnish your income, tax returns, any other source of money that you may be receiving. And once this happens, it is too late and you would have to just pay back the debt. When you receive a summons, you need to act fast. This is where you may wanna think about a debt settlement because credit repair may not be quick enough for you to remove this collection account unless it is inaccurate. If it is inaccurate, you better make sure that you have all the paperwork and information lined up. Another thing that you should consider is contacting a credit attorney. These attorneys work on a contingency basis, meaning that if they don't win a case, then they don't get paid. As mentioned before, if the court does decide that you owe the debt, then this is usually the point of no return and you would just have to pay off the debt, usually in payments or get your wages garnished. Now let's talk about federal benefits for a second since I know that some will ask. Most federal benefits are generally exempt from garnishment 
except when you have to pay delinquent taxes, alimony, child support, or student loans. Meaning that if you get a judgment for those type of debts, then your federal benefits are fair game. States also have their own laws about which benefits can be garnished. Federal benefits that are generally exempt from garnishment includes social security benefits, supplemental security, income benefits, veteran benefits, federal student aid, military annuities and survivor benefits, benefits from the Office of Personal Management, railroad retirement benefits, and federal emergency disaster assistance. So this does it for me. If you guys have any questions, let me know in the comments and I try to get to as many as I possibly can, but just beware of the spam comments. So to make sure that it's actually me responding, just look for the check mark. If you have successfully handled collections before, let us know in the comments so you can spread the love. And if you wanna learn more about building credit and credit repair, check out these videos over here.